Turn with me in your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter number 2. 1 Timothy chapter number 2. How many you happy to be saved? Say amen. amen. Man, I'll tell you what, y'all look like it's about 9 o'clock at night. And uh, um, Selah actually, or Danielle texted me and said that Selah uh, was asking her, said, Mama, we've done Miss Church. It's dark. It's time to go to bed. And uh, I said, yeah, I feel like it. Amen. This has an effect upon me as well. So uh, if, if I look like I'm uh, dozing off, I promise you I'm not. I'm in the spirit right now. But no, I, no not really. Uh, I'll tell you what, it'll be really good for you as, as our practice, but it's a good time to get that blood stirring. Amen. Let's stand in reverence to the reading of God's holy word. First Timothy chapter number two. And uh, let me just preface what we're getting ready to read. Monday in my own personal devotion, I was in this, I was in uh, First Timothy and I came across this passage and the Lord hit me. And we've been studying the subject of prayer now for uh, over 30-something weeks. And uh, the Lord just told me on Monday, you're going to be preaching this Wednesday. And I thought, how providential this is where I arrived in my study. And you'll, you'll see why, because of the season we're in. And it's still in keeping with the subject of prayer. But listen to these ver- verses. I believe it's very applicable for where we are right now. First Peter chapter number 2. We're going to read verses 1 through 4. The Bible says, I exhort, therefore... That first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority. Well, when I read that, the Holy Ghost of God said, here you are. That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. I'm going to preach through verses number four, but let me go ahead and read verse number five. I feel guilty if I don't read verse number five. (laughs) For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Amen. Are we all in agreement on that? Amen. You may be seated. Like I said a few moments ago, I don't believe that I was in this passage by, uh, by chance. And uh, when I read it, I knew right then and there, God was already preparing my heart. Listen, I didn't even know the outcome when I started studying this, this passage. I didn't know who in the world would be the elect president. But at the same time, I bowed my head and I began to pray for President Biden. And I said, God, whoever you put in power, God, I'll continue to pray uh, regardless of who it is because this is your word. And God dealt with me about that. But that's not just the only issue here because this is concerning prayer and specifically praying for the souls of men. These verses, I, I promise you, they help put things into perspective for you. And they'll help you to examine your praying and renew your priorities as a follower of Jesus Christ. Uh, like I said Sunday night, my concern is when you go through a political season, people lose sight of the big picture. The big picture is not simply uh, trying to get people into a political position or, or vice versa or flip seats in the Senate or the House. That's not the end of all things. Some people think there's just a political agenda. And God's people a lot of times get distracted by that when the goal is the Great Commission and advancing the kingdom of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can I get a witness? You can get whoever you want to vote for, whoever you align yourself with, into uh, certain political arenas and and in positions. But at the end of the day, if souls aren't being saved, nothing is accomplished. And a lot of people lose sight of that, and the church cannot ever afford to lose sight of that. Sometimes some churches trade their pulpits for political messages, and that bothers me. That's trading the, 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 something that's temporal for that which is greater. We are called to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, we can preach uh, against sin and preach truth, but listen to me carefully. We will never, ever step down or trade our message for any lesser message. We are called to preach the gospel to every creature. We can never lose sight of that. I'm not minimizing elections and things like that. That's a responsibility you have as a citizen, and you have a privilege in getting to cast a vote. But when you come back to church, it's time to reboot, to reset, to refocus on eternal things and eternal matters. And so I want us to look at these. These are very important verses tonight. It's God's Word, by the way. 
It's God's word. And the subject is still prayer, but I want to walk you through these passages because they helped me before the election even came, and they helped keep me grounded even through an election season. And I, I trust they'll do the same for you. But in verse number one, the Bible says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. First, notice the, the call to prayer. In verse number one, the call to prayer. Now, Paul, you know he's writing to Timothy. Timothy's a young pastor, and he emphasizes prayer to him and says, Timothy, I I want you to exhort uh, the people in the church concerning prayer. And I'm exhorting you, but I also want you to to pass this on, your pastor, pass pass it on uh, to the people of God. You say, why? Well, churches need to be emphasizing prayer and pastors as as well to their congregations because prayer tends to take a back seat to many activities and is often minimized in the lives of Christians. That's why we spent so much time uh, speaking on prayer because prayer is something that uh, is often treated like uh, Leonard Ravenhill said many years ago as the Cinderella of the church. Kind of just while they're... There's something special about prayer. It's not really as attractive and something that we want to just really give our attention to, not right off the bat, until we understand how important it is and how essential it is. Then we begin to realize just how unique it is and how important it is in the, in the church. But praying tends to take a backseat a lot of times to many other activities. And Paul understood the importance of prayer and the place it should hold in the church among God's people. And therefore, he says, I exhort, therefore. That word exhort, it communicates, first of all, Paul's passion. This is uh, is a passionate call to prayer. I exhort. This word means to plead with. It means to urge greatly. Paul saying, in effect, I plead with you, I urge you greatly, I exhort you, and uh, this is to try to spur someone along, and it's like a coach giving a halftime speech to his team. He's trying to rouse them. He's trying to stir them up. He's trying to push his team on to victory, and Paul, and, and listen, uh, this is, has application to us tonight. He's standing before the church. He's writing to Timothy, but he's standing by, by or in front of the church And he's uh, saying through God's word, I plead with you. You say, with regard to what? To pray. I urge you to pray. I exhort you to pray. It's not just this preacher. It's the apostle Paul. And through Paul, it is the spirit of God who is passionately urging us to pray. Christians, we should have that same passion regarding prayer. And yet, if we do our own reflection, we understand why Paul, by the Spirit of God, is constrained to write this. It's because we tend to let the fire die down with regard to our praying many times, and it has to be stirred up time and time again. Is that not true? We'll commit to praying as we should, and if we're not careful, it'll become a routine. It won't be as passionate, and then when things come up, we'll begin to let things slip, and it'll take a back seat, and it needs to be stirred up constantly notice something else about this call to prayer in verse number one he said I exhort therefore that first of all first of all and he's talking about praying but he says first of all that indicates that this call to prayer is not only to be uh, passionate because he exhorts us to do it but it's also to be the priority first of all when the apostle writes first of all he's saying prayer should be the top priority It should be at the forefront of everything. It should be first of all, everything of everything we do. Let me ask you a question as we do some self-examination. Where is prayer in the list of your priorities? Is it first? Is it the foremost of all that we do? And by the way, don't just answer that. You have to examine your life to be able to really see where that lies in your list of priorities. You start out by asking yourself, how do I start out each and every day? Is it truly first of all? Do I, do I, do I have such a sense of uh, prayer being the necessity and the priority in my life that I can't even get out of bed till I first bowed my head and prayed? 
I, I can't even start my day until I spend a little time in communion with the Lord. Is, is prayer truly the priority that it should be in my life? Is it truly first of all? How soon we often forget, though, as Christians, the necessity of prayer. The Spirit of God knows this. That's why he's impressed upon uh, Paul, the apostle, to write to this pastor to exhort the churches to pray. We easily forget the necessity and our dependence upon prayer. And by the way, we often forget the sheer privilege it is for us sinners. Uh, We're saved, we're forgiven, but we're still sinful What a privilege it is for us to have audience with holy, omnipotent, omniscient God. What a privilege. The early church had the power of God upon it and turned the world upside down because praying was not an afterthought. It wasn't something they squeezed in when they had time, but praying was a priority of the early church. You can't go through the book of Acts without finding prayer just about on every page. <laughs> In Acts 4, and they prayed. Acts 4, 31, and when they had prayed. Boy, that's when God began to move when you study that passage out. In Acts 6, 6, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed. Acts 8, 15, who when they were come down, prayed for them. Acts 9, 40, but Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed. And on and on and on you can go through the book of Acts. You wonder why the early church made such a difference and made such strides in, in, into the unknown world, not just the Gentile world, but the unknown world, because they understood that power, uh, the power of God is made available through prayer, and they dare not try to do anything. They tarried in Jerusalem until the Spirit came upon them, and, and they were baptized in the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost, but they could not go, go forward and do anything apart from prayer. They tarried in prayer. Listen, we can have preaching and programs and teaching and training and singing and socials, but without God's Spirit energizing all that we do, we labor in vain. We wonder why we're so frustrated at times or seem like we're wearing out, burning out, and about to check out. Then we have to ask ourselves, how much time are we spending in prayer? Or is prayer really a priority? Then in verse number one again, look again, it says, I exhort therefore that first of all, and notice the different types of uh, aspects of prayer, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all. Man, notice the composition of prayer. In pleading with the church to make prayer a priority, Paul uses four terms which help us break down the type of prayers or aspects of prayer that we should be offering and making to God as people, as his church. And as you study each of these, these are different words. They give insight as to what our praying should consist of. First of all, he says, I exhort therefore that all supplications be made. Supplications, that that word speaks of intense, special, even personal needs. Supplications are requests that arise out of a burden, generally from something that is lacking. It's a special need that arises, and it brings forth a special request in a time of need. And then the word prayers. You say, I thought all these were prayers. Well, all these are types of prayers, but the word word translated prayer here is a different Greek word. And it has reverence actually attached to this type of prayer. It describes a humility of mind as approaching or bowing before one who you recognize as royalty. This general word for praying, what it's speaking of with regard to the Christian and praying, it involves the worship of God as we bow before God and seek to give him glory. And by the way, prayer should always consist of that. Prayer is not just running and give God a grocery list. It is also the time that we commune with God and worship him. If we don't take time to worship him, we haven't truly prayed as we should. We bow before him and we seek to give him glory. But he also notes intercessions. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers. Then he says intercessions. Intercessions. 
This word means that a believer stands before God. This is a privilege, by the way. A believer stands before God and can do that in behalf of another. A lot of times we go to God in prayer and it's just about us, but as Christians, because we've got the mind of Christ, when we go into communion with God and pray to God, we ought to be making intercessions for others. What has our Lord done for us? He has made intercession for us. If you're going to be Christ-like, you're going to have to make intercession for others. While this kind of praying is to advocate for another, it's not simply just cold, uninvolved, distant representing a rep representation of another. This word involves empathy, sympathy, and compassion. It's praying for someone with a true concern and, and heartfelt desire to see their need met. And what a privilege that is. Isn't that a privilege to be able to go to God in prayer in behalf of another? And go to God in behalf of another and lay their need or even uh, the condition of that person and make pleads before God in behalf of that person. What a privilege that is. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplication, prayers, intercessions, and notice, and giving of thanks. How appropriate. We're getting ready to hit the Thanksgiving holiday. And giving of thanks be made for all men. Giving of thanks. This describes prayer in which we take time to recognize, review, recount, and recite the grace and the kindness of our Lord and pour out our hearts in praise and gratitude to him. Take time. Listen, I know we may come to God and we got a burden and we've got a need, but we need to take time to begin to rehearse and review and remind ourselves of just how good and merciful and compassionate God is. The very fact that we have audience with God says that we ought to be grateful to God because God is holy. And how in the world do us simple beings have access to him? Well, it's only because of grace and the blood of Christ. That's something to forever be thankful for. And by the way, to give thanks at the end of prayer, you've got to activate faith because a lot of times you're praying about a situation or something that you don't think is ever going to happen. It's going to take faith to actually believe that. And I'll tell you what, when you begin to give thanks, you're having to activate your faith. Say, God, I'm going to thank you for what you're going to do. Amen. But all praying should comprise of giving thanks to God. Let not that one who has an a spirit of ingratitude, think that he'll receive anything of God. You say, that's not what Brother James says. No, that's not what Brother James says, but I'm kind of boring his phraseology. Can I tell you, God is, uh, he's concerned about our gratitude. Ingratitude characterizes unbelievers if you study out Romans chapter number one, but can I tell you, if you're going to enter into God's presence and draw near to him, you've got to come with the spirit of thanksgiving. Psalms 100, verse number four says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving. You want to draw close to God, you come giving thanks, amen, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Now look again at verse number one. I therefore, or I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks. Notice the next phrase be made for who? All men. And then specifically in verse 2, for kings and for all that are in authority. Notice thirdly the concern of prayer. Too often our prayers are limited to our own personal needs, to the needs of our family or to the needs of our friends or just the needs in our church. But here the Apostle Paul calls us, he exhorts us to make prayer priority, but not just a priority for the church and for our needs and, and for our family and friends, but for all men. And we're to pray with supplications and prayers and intercessions and giving of thanks, and they're to be made for all men. What's he concerned about? Well, the reaching of all men. The reaching of all men. Now, this plea is starting to take shape. What is the aim of 
praying these different types of prayers to God for all men. Is it for the health of all men? Is it for the financial success of all men? Is it for the political pr promotion of all men? No, it is for their salvation. This is evangelistic praying, and that's what Paul is desperately calling the church to, as we shall see in verse 4. But let's think back through the four aspects of prayer. You've got supplications and prayers and intercessions and giving of thanks. Now, let me ask you some questions as we begin to think about those different aspects of prayer. What supplication, what special need does every person have? Well, we're to make intercessions in behalf of all men. Well, well with regard to my uh, fellow believers, my brothers and sisters in Christ, it might be they have some special temporal needs, but we're all in need of sanctification. And if I see somebody overcome or overtaken in a fault, I'm going to be praying. I'm not going to be pointing fingers and just sitting back and, you know, passing judgment and saying, I knew it. No, look, I need to be making intercession in behalf of them, amen. I, I need to be making intercession. Listen, uh, I, I need to be going to God in their behalf and doing business. If they have lost loved ones, I ought to be making supplications for the specific need for the salvation of their children's souls. If they have home problems, listen, I ought to be, I ought to be doing this in their behalf. And beyond that, in the workplace, in the schoolhouse, in, people, in places where I come in contact with, and I see all kind of wickedness, and people say, man, you don't know how wicked the people are. My boss is lost, and, and everybody else that I go with, they're heathens. I'll tell you something, if we are God's people we ought to be praying and making intercession and and going to God with supplications for these needs for the salvation of these souls by the way why do we generally pay or pray more for the healing of the saints than we do the saving of the lost have you noticed that old Adrian Rogers used to used to say that all the time. We pray more to keep the saints out of heaven than we do keep sinners out of hell. Now, what's the greater matter? The eternal matter. And too many times we lose sight of that. And that's why we're, we're, we're called and we're exhorted to make these intercessions, these supplications and prayers, intercessions and, and giving of thanks for all men. You say, what do you mean giving of thanks, Brother Mark? Well, did you realize that God receives great glory whenever he changes the life of a sinner, rescues them from hell, gives them eternal life, regenerates them, and makes them a trophy of his grace? If we truly understand it, it'll show up in our praying. Do we sympathize with sinners and thus intercede for them? Or do we see them simply as wicked, hell-deserving, while forgetting that at one time we were in that condition, and thank God somebody prayed for us? Do we give thanks to God? You say, how can you give thanks to God if you're praying for all men and, and the majority of men are wicked? Here's why you give God thanks. Because the same gospel that saved you has the power to save them. And I can, listen, even when I'm praying for the wicked heathen, I mean people that are God haters and blasphemers, I can praise God that he is a saving God and he's able to save to the uttermost. While God is not calling us specifically in this prayer, to pray for every single person individually in the world, that would be impossible. When he says pray for all men, he's not saying you got to know everybody. And every That's not the uh, implication here. He's simply instructing us to pray for all men, including sinners without limitations. In other words, there should be no people we can't pray for. So Christians, we have a biblical obligation to pray uh, not just for our family and friends, but also lost people in general, for all men to be saved because that's where this, this instruction is going is that they ultimately might be saved. And then God adds this. So we're to be concerned about souls. And it's, it's uh, biblical to pray for the salvation of our friends and our family, but also for all men. But he adds this in verse number two. It's very interesting. It says, for kings and for all that are in authority. Specifically, here we're told to have a concern in our prayer for the rulers in authority. Now, why are we told this? 
Well, because political rulers and civil authorities many times in every generation around the world are not really uh, respecters of our God, respecters of the Christian faith or the Word of God. And so the temptation for all believers is to hold them in a lesser view. In fact, hold them in disdain, dislike them, hold them in disgust for their ways. And and by the way, this passage really begins to uh, have a lot of weight when you realize that Nero was in power at the time that Paul wrote this and the Roman government was wicked as it could be and persecution was starting to heat up. And so when you begin to see those who oppose the church who are anything but godly in power, who, uh, who have uh, breathed out threatenings towards you, a lot of times you don't feel like praying for those kind of people. Such neglect to pray for our leaders is a failure in the prayer life of a believer because the Bible instructs us to give them, a spe- or give them specific attention in our praying. If you can only pray uh, for, for leaders on one side of the aisle, you're not very Christ-like. Isn't that true? If we can only mudsling at certain people and we'll pray for others, we're not very biblical and not very spiritual. If we can, it reveals a serious, when we can't pray for whoever God allows, God's the one who ordains government, allows people to get into power. If you can't pray for the one who's leaving and the one who's coming in, it reveals a serious sinful indifference in your heart. To God, his word, because he commands it, and a serious indifference toward the souls of men. It is hypocritical and totally unchristlike to say you care about souls. You care about those who Christ shed his rich red royal blood for, but refuse to pray for certain souls because of their office or their political affiliation. Wow. Wow. I'll pray for this soul, but I won't pray for that soul. God help us if we find ourselves in that kind of trap. And I guarantee there's a lot of Christians that need to repent of this. Well, we can criticize, we can criticize, we can criticize. And some people are worthy of criticism. I, I, I assure you of that. But at the end of a day, whether you got a donkey or uh, an elephant attached to your political office, that's still an eternal soul that Christ shed his blood for. Is that not true? How many of you want to see Biden go to hell and burn forever? What about Donald Trump? Who would like to see Donald Trump cast into the lake of fire? Who would like to see Kamala uh, banished from all, for all of eternity into an a, a, a outer darkness? And we lose sight of that if we're not careful. I'm trying to make the application right here. Uh, the, the, uh, the readers here would be worried about or be having to deal with those that are in power in the Roman Empire and, and uh, Nero and all these people. At the same time, uh, Christ died for Nero. These are souls. We don't have to like policies. We don't have to agree with everything they do. But listen, at the end of the day, we can't lose sight that we must pray for all men. And that means all men. And we can't disconnect that from those in the political realm either. If we didn't have a problem with that, Paul wouldn't be addressing it. Why does he tell them that? Because we tend to say, I'll pray for all men. But I'm not praying for those up there. And so he's addressing it. Listen, our prayers for kings and all those in authority, it's not simply we're praying for them to make righteous laws and rulings, our rulings, but our prayer for those in civil authority and hold political power, we ought to be praying that every one of them repent of sin and place their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and receive eternal life, and escape the wrath of God, and join us in heaven. Why? Because Christ died for their souls. Now look again at verse number two. For kings and for all that are in authority. Now notice this, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Notice the consequence of prayer. Here's a benefit. When you begin to pray, not only for all men, but even those in uh, political offices and power, 
Here's a benefit for Christians. According to God's word, prayer for those in authority should be passionate and a priority for God's people because it will help create favorable social conditions for the church. And why would we like that? So that we can evangelize freely. We're praying for those in power for their salvation, but at the same time, if God moves upon their heart and they hold a favorable view toward Christians, I mean, they don't come after us, then we've got a window, we've got an opportunity to evangelize without harassment, without being hindered in so many ways. By the way, when you pray for those in power, can I tell you something that's going to extinguish any provoking or seditious thoughts of reactionary or unlawful resistance against those in power. Notice that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Praying for those in authority transforms Christians into peacemakers, into model citizens, not into rebellious rioters. That's not Christian. That's not Christ-like. For kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life. It promotes a quiet and peaceable life. That's our conditions in society. Quiet means free of external disturbances. Peaceable is the internal disturbances. But notice, in all godliness and honesty, that's our attitude toward God and then reflecting behavior. Our attitude toward God is in all godliness, it's in reverence, it's always thinking about God and what's pleasing to Him. And in honesty, that's the way we walk before men, that's our behavior because of godliness, and that's an integrity before others. But church, never discount the power of God to work in response to prayer. If we're called to pray for those in power, and we're not doing that, don't get upset when it seems like the church is being harassed and there's growing hostility. Don't complain when it seems like the legislation is going against us. Don't complain because we're not doing what the Bible commands us to do. And we all can say, oh, me right there. I think we all can do better in this area, every believer. But never discount the power of God at work in response to prayer. God can cause the, are the righteous to find favor in the harshest of conditions. Did you know that? Even in the most vilest of societies and hostile toward Christianity, God can cause favor to fall upon his people. Did you know that? What about old Daniel there in Babylon? You can't get more wicked than Babylon. You can't get more of a dictator than old Nebuchadnezzar. And yet D Daniel was able to find favor in the eyes of one of the greatest heathens before he was converted. Can I get a witness? How is that possible? Can I tell you there's a God in heaven that can move upon the hearts of even wicked men? And so we're told to pray for these in power. And it says that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. In other words, as we pray, God's going to honor that and how he's going to work it out. Well, first of all, we're not going to be the rioters. We're not going to be the uh, rebels. And so... We're going to be model citizens. It's going to work on us, but at the same time, God can work so that we find those favorable conditions. Not only that, but if God begins to save the leaders in government in response to prayer, as more and more come to saving faith, then peaceable conditions of the church will begin to increase. Imagine what happens if people start getting saved in Congress. How would that benefit us? We get to live a quiet, peaceable life. Can I get a witness? Too many times we're busy complaining about the people in office and the conditions of our society, and we have to stop and ask ourselves, do some real self-examination and reflection. How much time are we spending praying for those the Bible specifically tells us to pray for? Of all the people, I mean, Paul says pray for all men, then he specifically says under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and pray for the king and those in authority. He's saying give special attention, specific attention to those, those that group. Because that's going to affect the church. That's going to affect your ability to operate and evangelize. God's sovereign, but God wants you to have a part in this work. On the flip side, the opposite is true. If instead of being a prayerful people, praying for the leaders, 
and a peaceful people living a quiet, peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. We become the rebels in society, the rioters and the reactionaries against civil authority. You know what that's going to do for the church? If it's associated with the church, then the church becomes the menace in society. And it only worsens our condition. Now, this does not mean that Christians will not experience hostility if we pray for our leaders. 2 Timothy 3, 12 is real clear. All that live godly shall suffer persecution. All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But if we do suffer, let it not be as an evildoer, as Peter would say. You can't be one of these people who's always trying to stir up trouble and everything else and think, well, I'm suffering for Jesus whenever consequences come your way. No, it don't work like that. But here's why praying for all men, including civil authorities, matters. Look at verses 3 and 4. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Isn't that what we care about in the first place? What pleases the Lord? For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have some men to be saved who will have just men who uh, are in a certain political party to be saved, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Notice the cause of prayer we're given here. Why pray for all men? Not just those in power, but why pray for all men? Even the, the worst of condition men we might point out in society. Why pray for these men? Well, first of all, because it is good. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. God is good. He's the standard of good. God determines what is good by by his own self, by his own standard. He's the standard. And he said this is good. It is consistent with who he is. If it's good, it's got to be consistent with who God is. Who is God? What does the text say? God our Savior. God our Savior. He's a saving God. God's good and God's a saving God. Why pray that all men be saved? Because now we're praying consistent with the heart of God and the character of God. And he's a saving God. And it's his will to have all men saved. It's good to pray that God will save the lost from the corruption of sin and the eternal agony of hell. That means on the flip side or the converse, it's not good not to pray for souls. But when God sees his people praying for lost souls, when he sees you and I praying for the salvation of others, it pleases him. In fact, the Bible says it this way, it is acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. It's pleasing. I I guarantee you, God's not pleased when we're not spending any time praying for the souls of men. But it's acceptable in his sight when he sees the church praying for lost souls. You see, this is God's desire. Why did he send his son into this world? To seek and to save that which is lost. But let me read these verses again. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Now, let me just comment real quickly on verse number four, because some have tried to pervert this this verse and uh, peddle the false doctrine of universalism. Universalism says that everybody's going to come to saving faith. Everybody's going to be saved in the end. And uh, the Bible does not teach that. God has a determined, a decreed will that shall be accomplished. For example, it's his will that his kingdom come. That's what Christ prayed, thy kingdom come. That's what he taught us to pray, thy kingdom come. That's God's decreed will. It's going to happen. Nothing's going to stop it. Well, a lot of people read this and say, well, this is God's will, who will have all men to be saved. Therefore, it's going to happen. I mean, you can't thwart the will of God. Well, you got to understand, we talk about the will of God. There's the decreed will of God, which cannot be stopped. It will accomplish its purpose, but God also has a permissible will. His permissible will is where he expresses his desire, but it may or may not be accomplished. For example, it's not God's will that any, any of you sin, that I sin. But we sin, don't we? It's God's will that we live perfectly holy lives as believers, but we don't always do that. 
And so there is his permissible will where he simply expresses his desire. It doesn't force our will, and we don't always do it because we're not puppets, we're not robots. And in the same sense, it is God's deep desire to see all men saved by receiving the gospel, by coming to the knowledge of the truth, but he will not force that upon anyone. Man has a free will to receive or reject the knowledge of the truth. He can come to it by faith or he can reject it. But don't miss the point. While that's a distraction because people try to teach universalism, I don't want you to miss the point. The point is this, God loves the world. God's not a a good Calvinist, I promise you that. You don't have verses like this and teach that God's already before time determined which little baby is going to heaven or hell. Verses like this don't work with that belief or that belief system. The Bible says who will have all men to be saved. What's that mean? It means it's God's desire to save all men. God loves the world. You cannot have a correct theology and and, and teach like some hyper-Calvinist that God takes pleasure in in damning certain people to hell forever. When the Bible specifically says that God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God takes no pleasure in the damnation of sinners. His heart's desire, stated here before us, is that all will hear the gospel and be saved. That doesn't overrule their free will, but it is desire that they come and be saved. And by the way, why would Jesus weep over Jerusalem after they rejected him if he was a Calvinist? If they were already predetermined to go to hell, why would he weep over them and say, I would have gathered you like him? Well, the truth would be, well, no, you were already rejected if that was the case. That's not the case, though. God loves the world. His heart's desire is that all hear the gospel. But men do have free will. Therefore, first of all, because it's God's desire, prayer must be a passionate priority of every believer. And not only just for the believer, but for the church corporately. Let us not in our praying. And I want to challenge you, Sunday school teachers, I want to challenge you. I I thank you for those who come out on Sundays before service. Let's not spend all of our time just praying for the sick. We We need to get that list in. Let's not just pray about our temporal needs, but let's do what the Bible says and let's build our prayer list with those who are lost and connected to the church and our families and our friends. We know they're lost and call their names out in prayer. That's how you apply the Scripture. Don't just pray for your temporary needs. Thank God we can go to God for our daily bread. But what about those souls that are going to go to hell that you go to school with or or that you work with? What about those souls? We lose sight of that. And it's easy to lose sight of that. You say, I feel bad about that. I know I do too. But a lot of times we have to be reminded in Scripture and the Word of God comes to us where we are to stir us back up and get us back focused. After such a divisive political season... And that's one reason that I hate politics is because it causes people to get mad and begin to see, in the Christian realm, begin to see people with opposing views as their enemy instead of the mission field. This is such an important text. Christians, it's time to reflect on God's instructions and please our Lord and stay focused on the assignment. The assignment is to go make disciples. It's to preach the gospel to every creature. Can I get a witness? We cannot afford to lose sight of that. It is God's desire that all be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. How are they going to come to the knowledge of the truth? Well, here's the thing. God's given us all the resources. He has to do the saving work, but God's given us a commission. How do, they, how do they come to the knowledge of the truth? Well, the Spirit has to draw them, but someone has to present them with the knowledge of the truth. Someone has to share the gospel. That's where you and I come in. And so here's the implication if that's God's desire and that's how he's going to save by us taking the gospel to them and him opening their eyes, as we pray for people, God's going to move us to do what? You can't pray for God to save souls without God stirring you to go share the gospel with souls. I promise you that. You pray earnestly for the saving of souls, and God will put your feet to, to move or to movement. To, he'll put you in action. I promise you that. Because God will begin to convict you and show you as you pray, those souls that you're responsible for witnessing to. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes.
First things first. Can't lose sight of prayer, church. We can't lose sight of it. You say, well, I've got it in place. Well, praise God, protect it. Don't let anything distract you from it. And you say, but Brother Mark, I, I, I'll be honest. And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I, I'll be honest. During this time, I, I get caught up in politics or I watch it like ever. Listen, I watch stuff too and I pay attention. And, and you know what? I, whenever I was reading this passage, you know what God made me do? He made me bow my head and start praying for those who were in office. Those who are trying to get in office. God convicted me. And I thank God for that. And God said, don't you lose sight of their eternal souls. I want to take people from both sides of the aisle to heaven with me. And oh, how heartbreaking it would be if the only time I spent time in this world is uh, making ugly comments on Facebook about some politician and never pray for their soul and watch them ultimately cast into the lake of fire one day. Where's the gratification in that? I'll tell you, the devil's duping a lot of us. But the Bible's very clear. This isn't to make you feel guilty or anything like that. This is supposed to help us as God's people to stay focused on the right things. Yeah, we're to cast our vote. Have a, we have a, a biblical worldview and we take stands, but we've got to stay heavenly minded. We've got to keep an eternal perspective. And that one who don't agree with you and have the same political persuasion, they're still souls, aren't they? They're souls. Christ paid too great a price for their soul to not be concerned with their soul. And this passage reminds us we can't disconnect or separate or segment parts of society and say, well, I pray for men. I pray for the working man. I pray, no, we, we pray from the top down, right? Pray for all men. There's souls on the altar. If you want to come, you come, you got time. I praise his name, don't you? I praise his name. And I'm thankful that he's patient with me and he continually refocuses and resets me because I'm flesh and blood like you. I promise you that. make sure that in our prayer list it's sprinkled throughout it our lost souls not just our earthly needs not just some special needs in the church those are important I am not minimizing that but let's take a look and see how much time we're praying for lost souls can I tell you what it's going to do you do that it's going to increase your burden for lost souls I promise you that but God responds to prayer. How do you know what God tells us to pray? You do your part, I do my part. And let's do what we can to win souls for Jesus Christ. We're going to be dismissed in a closing word of prayer. Brother Justin, would you dismiss us?